dear students welcome to the first lecture of the course sustainable power generation systems today we will be discussing about the overall energy scenario in global and indian perspectives and then what are different power plants are prevailing and then why do you need a sustainable solution in power generation sector so these components will be summarized today so key discussion includes review of global and national energy scenarios overview of current technologies for power generation the need and concept of renewable energy based power plant now before we start with the power plant let us discuss some of the fundamental aspects say for example energy how do we define energy so energy is the ability to do work it may be propelling machines to convert mechanical energy burning fuels to convert chemical energy and then charging batteries which is nothing but conversion of chemical energy we can also define what is power is the rate at which energy is being converted from one form to another say so for example if we would like to know like how much energy is converted by a 100 watt incandescent light bulb here if we consider a incandescent light bulb it will emit light as well as waste heat sometimes that heat can also be applied right this entire analysis can be carried out with the help of first law of thermodynamics also we can take an example say for example we have fossil fuel so normally this energy is stored in fossil fuels and then if we have to convert to soft work then we need some kind of device right and again from soft work to electricity we need some kind of device so from stored energy in fossil fuel to soft work what is happening this chemical energy is converted to mechanical energy and then from soft work to electricity that means mechanical energy to electrical energy right normally if we consider a power plant this will give an efficiency of around 35 to 40% in case of thermal power plant right so now if again we are interested to augment the efficiencies and analyze the efficiencies then we need to take help of second law of thermodynamics right so this will give you like what is the exercises how we can include the aspects of increasing the efficiency of a power plant right now move on to the progress of energy use worldwide so here this figure shows the evolution of power generation systems from 200000 bc to 2015 in 200000 bc first controlled use of fire was demonstrated followed by use of coal for heating and cooking in 200 bc in 1839 solar photovoltaic effect was discovered and in 1882 first commercial hydro power plant was demonstrated in 1888 first windmill was installed to generate electricity in 1892 first geothermal district heating system was installed and demonstrated in 1951 first nuclear power plant was established in 1981 first large scale solar thermal plant was installed and demonstrated followed by 1996 initiation of hydrogen power plant and then in 2015 all the researchers and industries are moving towards sustainable 
power generation. So we must have clear understanding about sustainable power generation in order to use the resources effectively. Now let us see what is happening as far as per capita energy consumption is concerned. So here per capita energy consumption is varying with years and again with countries. You can see different countries have different per capita energy consumption, but our approach is to increase the per capita energy consumption because it relates with GDP, right? So we are always trying to have high GDPs. That's how we need more per capita energy consumption. And once we are interested to augment the per capita energy consumption, then we need to burn more fuels. That means we need to emit more carbon dioxide. So we need to give a thought how to reduce the carbon dioxide. Here as per the projected growth like 3 to 4 percent per annum is the projected growth rate in electricity demand from 2019 to 2050. So more energy need to be required to meet the demand. So this pie chart shows the primary energy consumption by fuels. So what you can see mostly energy are coming from fossil based fuels followed by renewables, hydro and nuclear. So that means fossil fuels share the biggest contribution to electricity generation globally. So as we are really increasing or we are trying to increase the per capita energy consumption that means we need to burn more coals then what will happen? We need to produce more energy that means we need to burn more fuels that emits lot of carbon dioxide to the earth atmosphere as a result of which there is a rise in global temperature. right? So if you see this plot it shows the variation of carbon dioxide emission from 1960s to projected years like 2030 what will happen. Okay? So already in 2020 we are here at this point. Okay? So it is expected to rise with years if we do not take immediate measure on this aspect. So here we can see the countries responsible for emitting carbon dioxide like China emits about 28 percent of the global carbon dioxide emission followed by USA 15 percent, India 7 percent, Russia 5 percent, Japan 3 percent, Germany about 2 percent and 40 percent comes from rest of the world. Also we can refer the killing curve it is generated in Mona Loa Observatory in Hawaii. It tells about the carbon dioxide concentration in the earth atmosphere. So if we see thousands of years ago it was more or less constant right slowly rise was very slow and if you see at this time there is a immediate rise and also for information the safe limit of carbon dioxide in the earth atmosphere is 350 ppm. But if you see in the today's atmosphere it is 419.85 ppm. So already we are in a very dangerous state. So we must have to think and take immediate measure for reduction of carbon dioxide. Coal accounted for over 40 percent of the overall growth in global carbon dioxide emission in 2021. So it is a really significant emission. Now let us see like what are different event took place in minimizing the carbon dioxide emission in the earth atmosphere that means global temperature. In 1992 as in the 21 is Rio de Janeiro, 2002 is a world summit on sustainable development, 2012 
the future we want Rio plus 20, then 2015 sustainable development goals. This conference of the parties are the ultimate authority to decide like what are the things we need to consider to reduce the global climate temperature. As per the Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki Moon, the sustainable development goals are a to do list for the planet that will transform the world. Okay? And that is how in one of the SDGs, that is SDG 7, is the affordable and clean energy, which is included as a part of sustainable development goals. In COP 26, which was held in Glasgow, the primary agenda was to reduce carbon dioxide emission. The effort to limit the global average temperature to 1.5 degree C, the carbon dioxide emission must be reduced by 45 percent to reach net zero around mid century, phase down of coal power and a phase out of inefficient fossil fuel plants. And in case of COP27, the primary agenda was to increase ambition and implement existing goals and strengthen commitment. Now, as per the Paris Agreement, 190 countries agreed to phase down coal power plants, a 76 percent drop down in the global pipeline. So, this figure shows about the global power generation prediction from different sources. So, as you can see precisely here in this plot, it is considered from 1995 to the predicted year 2050. So, here this black and purple color indicates this coal and nuclear. So, here you can see slowly it is increasing and then it is expected to decline with years. But if you see the renewable resources, it is increasing with time and it is expected that major share will be wind and solar by 2050, right. So, why this is so and why this is so important? The primary motivator for renewable resources are energy security, economic impact and carbon dioxide emission reduction. So, now we must say like clean technologies, we need clean technologies to reduce emissions. So, when we say clean technologies, what are the components included? First thing is use of alternative energy resources. Second thing is the use of energy efficient technologies. And third thing is the promotion of combined heat and power plants. So, this figure shows the traditional thermal power plant layout. I will explain the different components here. Primarily, we need a furnace to generate heat and then we need a boiler because this heat has to be transferred to the water, it will convert to steam and this steam flow through these pipes and expand in the turbine. And then this turbine is coupled with a generator where you can convert mechanical energy to electrical energy and then this can be transmitted through these grid lines. And finally, this can be utilized in the household or industrial applications. Here the steam coming out from the turbine has to be cooled and for cooling, cooling tower is used. So, here water is coming from the river and cooling is done and again it is rejected in the river. And then this water steam will be converted to water and this has to be pumped through this pumping mechanism to the boiler again. So, it will work in a closed loop and also this flue gas from the furnace can be utilized in many of the applications like economizer or maybe reheater and finally, this can be you now released to the earth atmosphere 
when its temperature is very low. Right? So, this is a traditional thermal power plant layout. Now, let us discuss the cycle behind it. So, as I have shown in the last figure, the layout. So, it happens something like this in a line diagram I am showing here. So, furnace we have, so we have to supply air and then fuel. So, proper stoichiometry has to be maintained in order to have high combustion efficiency. Then this heat has to be transferred to the water because there are a lot of water tubes and then boiler drum. Then steam will be generated and the steam will be passing through the different uh, lines which are high pressure and high temperature steam lines and that is injected to the turbine. Okay. Here mechanical work is produced and if we couple to a generator then we can produce electrical energy. And then rejects of this turbine has to be cooled and then it will be passed through a pump and then it will be recirculated again and again. Okay. So, here this process if we name it say for example, this may be 1, this may be 2, this may be 3 and this may be 4. Okay. So, we will make like 4 different processes 3 to 4 is the expansion, this is reversible adiabatic expansion and then we have constant temperature heat rejection and constant temperature heat addition here is the Q1 and Q2 is the heat rejection and then we will have again this is a pumping work, it is a reversible adiabatic process that means isentropic process. So, here also you can show in TS diagram. So, we have 3 to 4 is the expansion process what I have shown in the turbine, 4 to 1 is the heat rejection and then 1 to 2 is the pumping work and then this is heat addition. Okay. Heat addition. So, that means 1 to 2 process is isentropic compression, this is reversible adiabatic compression. Water enters the pump at state 1 as saturated liquid and is compressed isentropically to the operating pressure of the boiler. Right? Then 2 to 3, process 2 to 3 is the constant pressure heat addition process where saturated water enters the boiler and leaves it as superheated vapor at state 3 here and 3 to 4 is the isentropic expansion process where superheated vapor expands isentropically in turbine and produces work and 4 to 1 is the constant pressure heat rejection process where high quality steam is condensed in the condenser by using a cooling tower. Right? This is the traditional process and this is known as Rankine cycle and this cycle is used in many of the thermal applications. If we consider solar thermal power plant, there also we need to use this cycle for energy generation. What are the different traditional power plants? It may be fossil based or fossil fuel based or maybe nuclear or large hydro. So, under fossil fuel based power plant we will have coal based, oil based and natural gas based. Right? So, what are the different uh, difficulties associated with this fossil fuel based power plants? It releases significant amount of greenhouse gases. Climate change and global warming is a prime concern and this kind of plants emits various pollutants like NOx, SOx, particulate matter and uh, many more other noxious gases. And most importantly it is finite and depleting resources. So, we cannot think of utilizing it regularly for thousands of years, we need some kind of alternatives. 
And in case of nuclear power plant, as you know, it generates a lot of radioactive waste and is costly and it's really complex. Accident risk is there. We have three major accidents in the world. So that fears the installation of nuclear power plants. Then security risks is also there. And in case of large hydro, significant ecological changes due to construction of dams and relocation of communities are the prime concern. So, in nutshell, what we can say, we have finite source of energy if we use these traditional power plants, then we have technical devices, then we use it for different applications and the sink, that is the gases, the heat, what we release is nothing but a sink which is released to the earth atmosphere, which is not healthy. So, we need some kind of alternative resources. Now, let us pay attention about power generation from renewable energy sources. Scientists coined something like energy obtained from the continuous or repetitive currents of energy recurring in natural environment. So, here we have different sources like solar, PV and thermal, we can produce directly or we can use this thermal loot for electricity production. Then wind power, then biomass power, then hydro power, geothermal power, hydrogen energy, then ocean power. Okay. So, what are the benefits we have? It is abundant and sustainable, it is environmentally friendly and if we use these technologies, it will give energy independence and security. And also, we need to concern about economic opportunities, job creation, technological advancement and innovation, health and safety benefits. Now, one more approach for sustainable power generation is combined circular power plants. So, here we are showing three different cycles together. First thing is gas turbine cycle, then we will have steam turbine and then power generation from solar thermal. So, here this is a parabolic trough where you can generate up to 400 degree Celsius of heat or temperature and then we transfer this to some fluid or maybe water and then again we can heat it by using the exit temperature of gas turbine and then steam can be generated and that can be expanded in a steam turbine and then we can follow the same route what we have discussed before. So, here in the gas turbine power plant, so I can write this is Z T, this is S T and this is solar concentrator. So, we burn the fuel here, it may be nuclear fuel or may be you know, producer gas or maybe other fuels we can burn here. We compress it and uh, we supply compressed air and fuel, burn it and then product of combustion is expanded in the turbine and then we generate electricity by using a generator and this exit temperature is normally high in case of gas turbine and this exit temperature is utilized here in the heat exchanger. Also, we use the heat generated by this solar concentrator and then we can produce electricity. So, here also you can produce electricity and here also you can produce electricity. Okay. That is how we can combine many cycles to produce more electrical energy. I can give an example, say we have considered two plants, say Z T and S T and say efficiency of Z T, Z T is say 40 percent and efficiency of S T may be 30 percent. And if we are interested to 
find out this combined cycle efficiency it is define something like eta z t plus efficiency of steam turbine minus eta z t then eta s t. So, if we do the calculations it will be something like 58 percent. So, what I am showing here this 58 percent efficiency no single cycle can give you. So, when we couple this cycle then we can really increase the overall efficiency significantly. So, also when we compare with CSP this integrated solar combined cycle power plant reduces the cost of solar electricity by 35 to 40 percent. This is quite encouraging. Let us learn something about Indian energy scenario. So, India stands at fourth position in the world in terms of installed renewable energy capacity. So, it is found that about 42 percent cumulative installed capacity from non fossil fuel resources and 50 percent targeted till 2030. This can be more clear if we read this plot. So, this is something like fossil waste and this is like non conventional sources of energy. So, fossil waste contribution is about 58 percent and non fossil is 42 percent and as we have discussed before contribution of non fossil fuels are increasing with time because of different concern. So, renewable power generation increased by about 1.5 times from 196 terawatt hour to 291 terawatt hour since 2014. Also, we can have a look about the capacities. So, if you see this table carefully it is found that wind and solar contribution is really significant compared to the other renewable energy resources, but contribution need to be accounted for all. So, it is about 119 gigawatt of energy. So, if we consider power generation from solar energy, we can have two different modes like solar thermal and PV. Okay. So, when we talk about solar PV, it is the conversion of solar energy directly into electricity using solar cells. What is solar cells? A solar cell is a semiconductor device fabricated in a manner that generates a voltage when solar radiation falls on it. So, it may be standalone system or grid connected system. Standalone means we can use it when required at a particular place. Suppose, street light where we require light then we can have that installations at the locations and the power what we produce from the solar will be stored in the batteries and that will be utilized at night. For grid connected system we can tie our plant in a grid and there is a net, net metering system that means the amount of energy you consume and amount of energy you give it back to the grid will be recorded by a net meter. Finally, electricity bill will be adjusted at the end. So, this is an example of standalone PV systems. We will have solar PV, sun is here, it will give the photons and we have charge controller, then we have energy storage system and we have inverter and then we have domestic application. Okay. This charge controller will protect the life of the batteries and this inverter will convert DC power to the AC power okay, and these are the utilities. And there are different sizing parameters how big plant is required to meet the demand like daily, weekly and seasonal variations of electric demand 
solar radiation measurement of the area, options of orientation and tilt angle of PV systems, sizing of battery for storage and grid connected system looks something like this. We have PV panels, we have inverter, then we have feedback system and uh, we can provide the energy to the grid and also we can use it when required. Okay? So, net metering controls everything. So, in a grid connected system, a synchronous inverter transforms DC power from the PV arrays into AC power at a voltage and frequency that can be accepted by the grid. So, now let us learn how the solar energy can be used for power generation through thermal route. So, this involves the collection of solar heat which is utilized to increase the temperature of a fluid in a turbine operating on a cycle such as Rankine or Breton cycle. So, we can classify this thermal power plant into three categories low temperature cycle, medium temperature cycle and high temperature cycle. If the operating temperature is ranges from 60 to 100 degree Celsius, then we name it as low temperature cycle. If the operation is up to 400 degree C, then we name it as medium temperature cycle. If it is beyond 400 degree C, we name it as high temperature cycle. The fundamental principles behind solar concentrating power is to focus sunlight onto a small area that significantly increases its intensity. So, here I would like to say one thing, we have flat plate collector and concentrator. In flat plate collector also, we can generate heat and that heat can also be utilized for power generation, but its efficiency will be very, very less because its operating temperature is very less. Okay? But in case of concentrator, we are concentrating the beam radiation. That is how this one factor called concentration ratio has emerged here. If this concentration ratio is very, very high, then we can produce very intense heat and that can be further used for other applications. So, for flat plate collector, this concentration ratio will be 1, okay? because this area where energy is falling and energy is receiving is same, but here it is different. The say for example, it is something like this. So, this may be concentrator and this may be absorber. So, solar radiation comes here strikes and it is reflected, comes here reflected. So, it is defined something like the amount of radiation which is falling on this concentrator, this is maybe C and the amount of radiation received by this absorber is maybe A. So, here you can see the variation of concentration ratios. right? So, what you can see here two different system, this one is parabolic trough and this one is Fresnel lens collector. So, here in both the cases we can go up to 400 degree Celsius. So, here is the mirror or reflector and this is the receiver. Okay? Solar radiation comes and reflected back to this receiver. Okay? So, these are the mirrors and observer tube is here. So, sun ray falls here reflected to the observer. Okay? this sunlight is reflected and concentrated onto a receiver tube running along the trough's focal line and heating a fluid flowing through it. So, that means, heat transfer fluid is flowing through this tube from inlet to the outlet and finally, it is connected that heated fluid and maybe that heated fluid uh, like oil has to be that heat has to be transferred to water and then water will be evaporated then steam will be formed and that steam will be utilized for power generation. 
and also we can have this kind of configurations here we have parabolic disk and this is the receiver so sun rays falling from here and in this case you no know, sterling engine is attached here that means it's a external combustion engine when heat is supplied the fluid is expand then there is a device which connects a rotor and then finally we can produce electricity out of it and this is an example of heliostate reflects the sunlight on the receiver so this is solar tower so these are called heliostates sun ray comes and strikes on the heliostates and it reflects and strike on the receiver and then you can see big power plant is located at the base of the unit okay so here we can produce very high temperature is close to 800 degrees celsius so we can run a very good power plant here and salt is used as a no uh, heat exchange medium and in case of wind power generation this wind is a form of solar energy caused by combination of three concurrent events first one is the sun unevenly heating the atmosphere second is irregularities of the earth surface third is the rotation of the earth historically windmills have been used for milling grains pumping water and other mechanical power applications so what happens in case of wind energy harvesting this kinetic energy of the wind strikes on the wind turbine and then we produce mechanical power and if we connect to the generator we produce electricity the average annual wind speed of 6.5 meter per second or greater is recommended at a height of 80 meter from the ground and this is considered commercially viable so you can see the growth of electricity generation from uh, wind with years see how it is progressing from 2010 to 2020 and it is expected to rise in the coming years as per the predictions and global climatic condition about 55% higher growth in 2021 than in 2020 has been observed and we can have two different installations onshore and offshore so in onshore wind energy harvesting it producing electricity by harnessing the wind from wind farms located on land and offshore is harnessing the force of wind that is produced on the high seas okay so it produces high power because disturbances are not there in case of offshore wind energy harvesting so we can see wind turbine will be something like this we'll have blades then we'll have generator and this is the rotor blades this generator and gear box is here and as a whole this is called nacelle and power cables are here and this is the tower okay and transformers are installed at the bottom and then finally we can transmit the energy to the utilities say a rated power of a wind turbine is 3 megawatt and annual capacity factor of the plant is 0.32 that means the actual power to the maximum power available at a particular site and efficiency is 39% with this consideration we can calculate the annual wind energy generation the annual energy generation is something like rated power multiplied by annual capacity factor multiplied by efficiency and total hours in year so if we have to solve this problem then how to move ahead say for 365 days for 365 days how many hours will be it will be 365 multiplied by 24 okay 24 hours 
then if we multiply it will be something like 8760 hours right then we can calculate what is annual energy generation which is nothing but 3 megawatt 3 megawatt multiplied by capacity factor of the plant is 0 0.32 and efficiency of the wind turbine is 0 0.39 and how many hours it is 8760 hours. So, it will be something like 3280 megawatt hour. Okay. Therefore, the wind turbine will generate approximately 3280 megawatt hour of energy annually right so we will be discussing all those aspects very critically in the respective modules let us consider biomass power generation bioenergy is the general term for energy derived from solid carbonaceous material of living matter the modern bioenergy is the largest sources of renewable energy globally and it is accounting for 55 percent of renewable energy and over 6 percent of global energy supply. So, you can see the installed capacity of bioenergy in India. So, it is indicated in colors. We can have wood residues, farm waste, energy crops and organic waste right and this biomass is renewable widely available and provides real employment and carbon neutral that's why we are very much interested about power generation from biomass resources let us see the conversions we can have woody plant material, cellulosic plant material, starch plant material, oily plant material, then microorganisms, then waste material. So, we have different routes of utilizing these resources. It may be pyrolysis, we can produce some gases and that can be used in engines and produce electricity. Also, we can have gasification process, we can purify the gas and produce hydrogen that can be applied in fuel cell and finally, we can produce electricity and also we can produce liquid fuel as a byproduct of pyrolysis and we can use it in engine application. If we have cellulosic plant material, we can go for anaerobic digestion where we can produce biogas, it is a gaseous fuel and then we can use it for vehicular applications. Also, if we have waste material like cooked waste, uncooked waste that can be treated and fed in, a, in an anaerobic digestion system and we can produce gaseous fuels. And if we have a starch plant materials, then we can do fermentation and we can produce liquid fuels. And if it is oily plant like Jetropha, Pungamia and that kind of uh, plants and microorganisms like algae, then we can use extraction and we can produce liquid fuels and finally, we can use it for vehicular applications. Also, many more things can be extracted from biomass resources. Let us discuss about the hydropower generation. So, in India, hydro projects having capacity less than 25 megawatt is called as small hydro. So, if it is more than that, then we call as large hydro. But this norms follows differently for different countries. For your information, if our station capacity is less than 100 or equal to 100 kilowatt, 
then we call as microhydro. If the range is from 101 kilowatt to 2 megawatt, we call as mini hydro. And if the station capacity varies from 2 megawatt to 25 megawatt, we call it as small hydro. The primary component of a hydroelectric power plants are as follows a dam or diversion structure, what you can see here this is the reservoir, a turbine, we have turbine here and a generator. So, that is how we say the dam creates a reservoir allowing water to accumulate. So, here water accumulation will be there and then this is called penstock. Okay. So, water will pass through this pipe, this pipe is known as penstock and then it strikes on the turbine blade, then it rotates and then this is coupled with generator and from that we can generate electricity. Right? Now, if we are interested about the power developed by the turbine, how we will work on it? So, this P which is nothing but power developed by the turbine is equal to 9.81 multiplied by Q which is nothing but discharge and H is the head. So, if this is the case then turbine safety is here and maybe we can consider this is the head and we can consider the Q you know, amount of water flowing tray section is nothing but discharge which is coming and striking on the turbine blade. And then if we know the efficiency of the system eta, okay, it take care of generator efficiency, then turbine efficiency and everything. Then you can calculate what is the power developed, right. But in nutshell, we can say for modern hydroelectric power plants, the efficiency varies from 80 to 90 percent. This system is quite efficient. Let us understand by solving one numerical problem. So, it goes something like say, for example, we have two different sites maybe site 1 I can write here and site 2. Okay. So, in first site we are considering a mountain. Okay. So, this is a mountain and its head is 25 meter and Q is say 600 liters per minute and in side 2 say for example, this you consider like a Niagara Falls head. So, its head is say 100 meter and flow rate maybe 6000 liters per second. Okay. Can we calculate the power developed? So, in this case this P which is in kilowatt is something like Z is 9.81, then Q, H, then eta. Of course, we need to multiply to it density, right. So, same expression is whole good for other calculation as well. Okay. So, both the cases fluid is water. So, we can substitute the values what is given to us like z is 9.81 and q is we can you know, do some kind of exercise before we are using. So, 1 liter is 10 to the power of minus 3 cubic meter and 1 minute is 60 second. right? So, this will be something like 10 to the power of minus 2 meter cube per second. right? So, here it is 6000 multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 3, this is cubic meter 
per second, right? So ultimately, it will be six cubic meter per second. Okay. So in the first side, if we substitute the values, what is given for the side one is ten to the power of minus two. H is twenty five and efficiency what we have considered in the early case may be 0.9 we can consider our density is 1000 okay so this will be in kilowatt okay and here same thing 9.81 then 6 then h will be uh, 100 meter then we will have maybe 0.9 and density is 1000. Okay. So, we can check our dimension as well. So, z is meter square meter per second square then meter cube per second this is meter and then kg per cubic meter. Right. So, this is gone this kg meter per second square is Newton kg meter per second square is Newton Newton meter is joule, joule per second is what? Okay. So, it is correct. So, this will be in in what? Okay. So, of course, this will be in what? And kilowatt if we if we can consider kilowatt as well. So, e, this is approximately 2 kilowatt and this is approximately I think 5 gigawatt or something like this. Okay. So, this is how we can do the calculation and uh, of course, we must know one thing here this head what we have mentioned. So, this is like the actual head. So, these heads are varying because water is flowing through pipes and there will be a lot of friction and losses. So, this actual head what we have here is 100 meter, but you will not get at the end it may be no 90 meter you will get because of this frictional losses. Okay. Okay, let us move to the next discussion. So, now we will discuss briefly about hydrogen energy and fuel cell. So, here what happens? First thing we need to generate hydrogen, then the generated hydrogen has to be utilized in a device called fuel cell where we can generate electricity. right? So, how to generate hydrogen first? So, electrolysis is one of the process by which we can split water into two molecules hydrogen and oxygen. Okay? So, here we can provide some kind of renewable resources may be solar or maybe wind. Okay? So, we can provide DC power to split water. Okay. So, maybe minimum 1.23 volt or maybe we can if we consider losses 2 volt is required to split no what is called uh, uh, water. Okay. So, water is accumulated here and is voltage is supplied and hydrogen will be generated in the cathode side this is negative part and oxygen will be generated in the anode part which is a positive part. Okay? And sometimes we can provide like hydrogen rich gas as well like producer gas also we can inject in this channel in order to produce hydrogen. Right? So, once we produce hydrogen then that can be utilized in fuel cells. Okay? So, we will have two electrodes one is anode, other one is cathode okay? and we have electrolyte. So, hydrogen is supplied here and then reaction will take place and it will produce proton and then electron will move through this external circuit okay? and then this will again combine here in the cathode and it produces H2O. Okay, and electricity will get here. And this is like fuel cell is an electrochemical device and 
it converts chemical energy of hydrogen directly into electricity. Right? Now, people are thinking about beyond the individual use of these cells. So, we can couple many cells to make stacks and then we can have many stacks to power say hydrogen vehicle or maybe other devices. On the top of it, people are thinking about integrated gasification fuel cells. So, we can produce syngas first by using reactors, it may be fixed bed reactors or may be fluidized bed reactors. And once we produce producer gas, which is a composition of carbon monoxide, hydrogen and methane primarily, it is also called syn gas and that can be purified further to extract hydrogen and then that hydrogen can be used in fuel cell for electricity generation. So, that is how we can couple gasification system and then fuel cell and that is how researcher has named it as integrated gasification and fuel cell cycles. right? And normally for this kind of situations, we prefer the fuel cells which works at high temperature. So, example is like solid oxide fuel cell which is used at high temperature for generation of electricity. We will also emphasize some of the other renewable energy power generation systems like ocean thermal power generation in shorts we call it as OTEC. OTEC is a renewable energy technology that harnesses the temperature difference between the warm surface water and cold deep water in the ocean to generate electricity. So, there are some threshold limit. So, minimum temperature difference should be more than 20 degree Celsius. Then we can suggest power generation through this technology. We can also generate energy by utilizing the heat of the earth. So, we can produce steam at temperature 180 to 250 degree Celsius and then we can use organic Rankine cycle or maybe no Rankine cycle to produce electricity. So, this technology is known as geothermal power generation. Then we have tidal power generation. This tidal power generation harnesses the energy from the rise and fall of ocean tides to generate electricity. Okay. And again we have wave power generation. This technology harnesses the kinetic energy of ocean waves to produce electricity. This all technologies will be discussed in the upcoming modules separately because we will be more concerned about design aspects of all those technologies. We can finally compare the different renewable energy power sources in terms of power density, levelized cost of electricity generation, efficiency and land area. In case of solar, the energy density is about 700 to 1000 watt per meter square, which is quite high and biomass is about 0.5 to 10 and wind offshore is 3 to 20, onshore is 1 to 10, then hydro 10 to 1000, OTEC 0.1 to 1 and tide and wave it is 1000 to 10,000. And we can see the level as cost of electricity generation is lowest in terms of solar and it is highest in case of wave and tide. And efficiency as we have demonstrated is very high in case of hydro in comparison to all the renewable energy technologies. We have also fair efficiency in case of wing conversion, it may go up to 50 and solar comes at the end, its variation is 15 to 25 percent. 
and land area required is 4 to 8 acres per megawatt in case of solar which is the lowest compared to the other technologies. Now, apart from this, we need to realize how to store the renewable energy sources or renewable energy electricity generation because for solar and wind mostly these are available in particular time. So, we cannot expect it will give in 24 hours. So, say for example, if we consider solar, we need to store energy in order to use at night and in case of wind, wind energy is available in a particular time. So, during that time potential is very high and rest of the time potential is not there. So, during that time we can generate and store energy so that we can meet the demand during the peak demand period. So, we need to realize the need of sophisticated energy storage system. Hence, I would like to comment like appropriate energy storage technologies and cost of generation plays a crucial role in overall sustainability. In summary, I can comment that in this lecture we have discussed national and global energy scenarios and also clearly we understood the need of renewable energy based energy generation system. Also we understood the basic functioning of a power plant like Rankine cycle, what are different processes involved and also we got overall idea about renewable energy based power generation technologies and also greatly felt that in order to have sustainability we must consider storage system effectively for appropriate purposes. So, thank you very much for watching this video. Thank you. Thank you.